Okay, so if you're not here for this talk, still, please do stay. We need to get more people in here. So a quick introduction. I'm Julian Stephen. I am a researcher at uh, IBM Yorktown Heights Research Lab. And uh, this is uh, Sruti. She also, she's my colleague. And we can get right into it. So while we uh, stare at this title, a um, few things about ourselves. As part of our day jobs, we are lucky to experiment with some new technologies, being able to slap things together to see if it works. So for the last six to 10 months or so, we have been working on uh, this project. So we are trying to see how we can leverage improvements in large language models for API security. So to begin with, everything uses some kind of APIs, my smartwatch, mobile phone. If I have a application running in the web, in the cloud, in a single pod, I have APIs talking to the databases. I have APIs calling, the front end's calling API to the back end, so on and so forth. So we can literally say there's an API explosion here. And we want to see how we can leverage AI to help manage some of this. So that's kind of the core idea. Now, to generate some of these pictures, I tried to use AI. Yeah, pretty okay, I feel. But some of the other pictures are also, also nice. So I wanted to do some of the other pictures when I uh, put in the prompt API explosion. But the picture I liked best was when I used this prompt, which said, <coughs> Realistic photos representing an explosion of APIs. And I put in this prompt and I was greeted with this strange but serene picture of bees. And a bird eating a bee and more bees and so on. So we do understand that AI is not appropriate for all kinds of use cases. But do, we do believe that we, we, are, we are able to hit a use case that is practical and very useful. Okay, so as a cloud administrator dealing with this large number of APIs, what, what are my challenges, right? So one of the problems is that if I want to manage these APIs, I do need to have application-specific knowledge. So if I want to enforce a policy, often I need to understand what this API means. Open API is great for it. I have nice descriptions, Swagger is great, but it still means that I have to read through the spec of large number of applications and then figure out what this application, what this API endpoint is doing and do some policy enforcement corresponding to it. So I need to learn a lot about the applications if I'm an administrator wanting to do something about this large number of APIs in my cluster. Second part is uh, APIs change often, difficult to update my policies or what I would need based on how APIs change. And finally, when we deal with any layer seven protocols, HTTP, the number of possible values for many of these uh, parameters are unbounded. I cannot really say that if I have a keyword or a parameter value, it will only have this limited set of uh, values in the, in the output, right? So I can have any key to mean anything. I cannot really quantify it. So to get an intuition of what we want to do, I am a cloud security administrator. And in my cluster, I'm seeing a whole bunch of these APIs. And I'm kind of concerned with the one specific feature of these. I'm kind of seeing that all of these APIs has a property that in the request, I can send in a parameter, count in that case, maximum results in the third case. And this parameter controls the number of responses I get back. Now, I'm concerned, can someone send in count equal 1 million? 
will it cost my backend servers to try and generate one million records in response? Maybe yes, maybe no. Maybe the application programmer was uh, diligent and did proper checks so that if I send in one million, the application developer is already saying, I will not send back more than 100. But that guarantee is often not available to us in many organizations. I'm administering a large cluster, so many applications. I don't know if every application developer has done something similar. Have, have been, they have been diligent to run those checks. So I'm concerned about all of these parameters, and I want to enforce the upper limit for all of these. And to do that right now, I have to understand that all of these APIs kind of belong to this group. And then I have to understand that for API application one, the parameter is count. For application three, parameter is max results and so on. So it makes my life very difficult. Uh, one more reason why as an administrator I would like to do this is imagine the application developer was diligent and did set a limit, but maybe the limit was too high. And the limit was set as you can send, uh, get back up to 10,000 results, but as an administrator, I only want 100. So I would like that flexibility. So this is how I, we are kind of envisioning uh, the system, if it works, it'll have its effect. So I have a simple API, it's hard to read. It just says the same example as before, count equal to question mark, and then I'm setting the query parameter count equal to 10 here. And then I set the value, click on send. 10 is a small number. I send the request, I get a response, all okay, no problem. But without knowing anything about the application, I want to be able to say, I have set a limit of 1,000, so 1,001, I should get a access denied. And I want the flexibility to do that without worrying about which is the URL for which I have to enforce the policy, or which is the application for which I have to enforce the policy, or what is the name of the query parameter for which I have to enforce that policy. So we have to ground this somewhere. So we started by looking at the OWASP uh, API security risks. This is extensive, covers a large number of, uh, covers a pretty broad field. And from this list, we started with two, uh, unrestricted resource consumption is when, when the attacker is able to cause the server to do more, to consume more resources than intended. So the example we just saw, right? So requesting a million records from the server, that's an example of that. On the right side, unrestricted access to sensitive business flows. This is kind of an example where if I have a scenario like uh, somebody is purchasing items from using a shopping cart, add to cart. And I don't want a user, I want to restrict the user from being able to use that purchase product flow from purchasing 10,000 tickets to a Taylor Swift concept, concert, right? So uh, typical scalping examples, trying to uh, access, trying to validate credit cards, so these are valid, legitimate business flows, I sh uh, but an attackers can misuse it. So as a cloud administrator, I, want, I would like to do something about APIs that do that. Okay, so I hope the problem is clear. Now, what can we do to solve some of this? So part of the, our solution essentially uses a couple of different technologies. Um, how many of you are familiar with Envoy here, heard of the term Envoy? One, two, oh, pretty good. So we have, we use Envoy, we use some WebAssembly, so many talks on WebAssembly uh, here itself, LLMs and OPA. So just a quick primer on each of these real quick. Envoy is just, uh, not, not just uh, Envoy, is uh, uh, your typical proxy on steroids, right? So you have your API request coming in, Envoy sits in the middle, and Envoy can uh, do things to the request, right? So Envoy can uh, log that request if for audit purposes or I can examine the request parameters and so on. So Envoy is great for that. And WebAssembly allows us to write fast code and you can write in the language of your choice, at least most languages of your choice right now. 
And once you write the logic to do the things that we mentioned in WebAssembly, it is compatible with Envoy. I can have a custom filter that runs my code once the uh, request is intercepted. LLMs, I shouldn't even have a slide up there. Uh, it's, everyone knows about it. In fact, I, I was trying to count the number of times the word AI was mentioned so in the talks I went to. Within like 45 minutes, I counted around 33, and I started losing count. So that is AI being mentioned once every one and a half minutes or so. Right? So you have your large language models. And finally, OPA is a tool for uh, policy evaluation. If you're not familiar with OPA, OPA kind of separates policy definitions and evaluations from application logic. So you can have, uh, you can write your pol policies in OPA. Your application can essentially say, hey, am I compatible to policy? And OPA will say, allow, allow or deny, and your application can go. So these are, these are the different components. And then what do we, what, what's the solution look like, right? So we have a API request coming in. The first step that we do is to, we have to identify the intent of the request. So in the examples that we saw, is the request trying to add something to cart? Is the request trying to uh, purchase a product? Or is the request trying to, or does the request have this uh, semantic meaning that my response size is dependent on my request, right? It's like the ex examples that we saw. So once we identify the intent of the, of the request, then it is easier to figure out what kind of policies are applicable. Now, what kind of intents, uh, before we go into that, so let's look at the architecture real quick here. We have your uh, layer seven traffic, service traffic on top, and the service traffic goes to your workload, and the Envoy proxy sits in front of the workload. This proxy can run as a sidecar if your workload is running in a uh, Kubernetes cluster or if it is running as a pod, or it doesn't have to if you have a standard web app uh, in a standard, it's just a VM event, you can have your Envoy proxy there as well. And once the proxy intercepts the request, the request goes to a custom plugin that we wrote. The plugin examines the request, and then it's the job of the plugin to figure out the intent of that request. So the plugin utilizes large language models to tag that request with the intent that we identify. This is expensive, so you had to make another call in the middle of the request. So caching works great here, right? So the number of API endpoints that you have is not infinite. So if you have a fixed set of endpoints, once I already made that request, I most probably do not have to make that call again. So it is the initial cost of identifying the intent of request can be amortized across a large uh, amount of time. So I check the cache, it's not in the cache, I reach out to the LLM to identify the intent. And then once I tag the request with the intent, I call the WebAssembly, uh, call my policy. Policy can be written in OPA or WebAssembly. The policy will check, is, my, is the request with this intent supposed to do this? We will talk more about what, how that means or what that means. Then the policy can say allow or deny. Right? And what do we mean, and what are the different kinds of intents that we, we are working with right now? Uh, we have grouped them just for the presentation as application intents, maybe technical intents. We started with what we call application intents like purchasing an item or adding an item to a cart or I mean, logging and logout, new user registrations. These we have found as like common flows across many applications. But we also found that there are some situations or some flows which are not really business specific. For example, the example that we saw where the response size is dependent on the in incoming request parameter. So that is also a, a flow, so to speak, common across many applications, but it doesn't really have a semantic meaning. So there are security specific meaning to some of these. Uh, file uploads, it's a, if, if an attacker is able to upload 
say, one gigabyte of data into your server. That is a problem. Administrator wants to prevent it. So these are the different intent tags that we want to work with. And uh, Shruti, you want to go to this? Hi, everyone. I'm Shruti Priya. I work as a research software engineer in IBM Research Yorktown Heights. Um, so as Julian identified the need of those intent tags, and we came up with a finite list of, the, of those intent tags. What we wanted to do as a next step is how relevant are those intent tags. For that, we took some applications under con consideration. For example, Shopify and Shopizer, which are common e-commerce applications. We, we checked Juice Shop application, which is an application, an insecure web application developed by OWASP. Then we took into picture Apache Finaract, Square, and PayPal. But these are common financial applications that are used worldwide. So what we wanted to do was to see how relevant are these tags across these applications. And the measure of relevance here is that how in, out of all the API requests present in an application, how many of them belong to these categories? So we did a study and we got that out of all the e-commerce application, in, in all the e-commerce applications, we have all the flows present. Um, for financial applications, we see that uh, tags like add to cart and commenting is kind of not there because it's kind of understood because in these kind of applications, we add a note about a client or a customer, but not really comment about a product, or we don't really add a, add a product to the cart. So in general, overall picture, we have tags, we have relevant tags along the applications. So once we have identified the intent tags, what we need for a policy enforcement point of view is to identify the intent parameters associated to that intent tag. So for example, in login intent tag, what we wanted to know was who is logging in? What is the credential? What is the username, password of that person? Then in add to cart, we wanted to identify what is the product ID that is being added and how many items of that product ID is being added to the cart. For commenting, we wanted to understand what is the actual comment in the request body. And for file upload, we wanted to understand the size of the file being uploaded to the application. For response records, which is an interesting case in here, so we wanted to see what are the parameters that directly control or explicitly sets the number of records in the output size. And as in the example mentioned by Julian, we have two parameters here with different requests. One is count is equal to 10, and another one is maximum results equal to 100. So what we wanted to uh, extract is the parameter count, maximum results, and the corresponding values of those parameters. Once we have identified these intent parameters out of a request, we want to enable or help policy writers to use a common language for mapping all these diverse request parameters into one common language. And number of records in here is that one common variable that we used. So any request which has parameters which are semantically belonging to an intent tag, by that I mean count, maximum results, which control their response size, they will all be mapped to number of records for a policy writer. And the para parameter values from those uh, diverse requests will be will be sent to the number of, will be allocated to the number of records parameter. And then cluster administrator can easily write policies using the num records uh, variable. How we are doing this? Of course, LLM. So we took HTTP request, we tuned prompt, and then we, pr we tuned prompt uh, on both two tasks. One was intent tagging, and another one was parameter extraction. We passed it to LLM, and as an output, what we got was intent tag and the corresponding parameters related to that intent tag. Here, since Julian mentioned the example of scalping, I'll take the flow of add to cart. So within add to cart, you see what are the parameters which are of relevance. So quantity and product ID. So these are some of the examples that we can extract out of a request which belong to add to cart category. Okay, so now the prompt engineering part of it. I am sure everybody would have played with prompt engineering up till, up till now. So 
we took a basic zero shot multi class classification approach and majorly we took like a class agnostic we constructed a class agnostic prompt what do i mean by class agnostic prompt so i created a positional encoding of all the intent tags so you can see on the left side of the screen that i have 1 2 3 which correspond to login logout user registration and relative positions for other tags within my prompt i have divided my prompt into system prompt and user prompt so for the system prompt i am telling my llm that you are a classifier and you classify the http request based on the provided reasoning and we basically don't we do not tell llm that you are classifying this http request as login because it will kind of uh, get uh, it will kind of utilize their previous information and identify it as login which might lead to a lot of false positive so why so that's why we took a class agnostic prompt we sa said the class number is 1 and we provided reasoning and clues for that particular class and uh, we also set a specified output format for the llm we did this because all of you might know that llm is moody and uh, it will not sometimes it will just spit out whatever it wants to so and also at the policy enforcement side we wanted the parser to be easily able to extract those parameters and as a user prompt we just said classify this http request and we provide we provided the http request in the form of method endpoint content type and body so what did i mean by reasoning and clues i will look into one correspond one one special response called records case and i will provide what is the reasoning to that so here the reasoning is if the http request contains query parameters that controls total number of outputs in the records uh, and then i provide clues clues are basically keywords that llm looks for, looks for so for example some of the example keywords could be count limit etc and what llm will try to do is semantically reason the same keywords while it is trying to infer one thing to note again about llm in our experiment is if you tell llm do this it's kind of happy it's peaceful but when you tell it don't do it it becomes sad hallucinates confused so what we did we we introduced an additional class called none and within that additional class rather than saying llm do not do this or do not classify it we said classify it as none if the http request has query parameters that only set sta starting point response this was done majorly to decrease the false positive rate because there were examples which we encountered where there were parameters which only set parameters like offset which only set the starting point of the records and that was also being classified as response records but this introducing none made made our job quite easy next task was prompt engineering for parameter extraction we took a task focused llm based approach and uh, we tried both zero shot and few shot prompting so again the same exercise we just told the llm in the system prompt that you are responsible for extracting parameters and then we specified the reasoning and clues for that tag and then we also specified what output we want the llm to give in give give out and then we provided the user prompt where the user prompt just said extract parameters from the http request and provided the http request so till now we have intent tag intent parameters what we wanted to do as a next step is to enable policy writers to use this meta information that we have provided using llm and enforce policies their custom policies by themselves so one we support two kinds of modes one is opa where we can we provide this contextual information about the request and we can pass it to an external authorization filter where the uh, where the policy writer can write policies in rego and uh, exercise it in opa another possible and a faster approach is tiny go interface which we have implemented in wasm which support which gives you an interface to implement your custom policies based on the needs of a of a cluster administrator and also uh, get uh, all the information about a request that we have extracted from llm as part of the interface the pctx policy context parameter provided in the functions 
So for, uh, for the framework to work, what is needed is the uh, intent tagging accuracy to be as high as possible. So we did like a very short study of uh, tagging the, uh, the APIs into these following flows and uh, identifying what is the accuracy. We saw an accuracy variation between 90 to 99%. For user registration, we went as high as 99%. But for for cases like none, we were we increase we are in the range of 85%. But since we use Llama 270B chat, we are hoping as models evolve, these numbers will go further up. So till now we have discussed about the motivation, we have discussed about the framework. Now we will see how this works in the demo. So on the left side of the screen, if you see, we have two major applications. One is OWASP Juice Shop, and another one is Shopizer. Since Julian mentioned the case of scalping, we will take uh, the use case of Add to Cart. So within, uh, within these two applications, we have selected APIs for adding items to the cart. And we will basically access exercise policies or the cluster administrator will write policies which will control adding items to the cart. How will the cluster administrator do it? Is if you see on the right side of the screen, you have uh, it, the cluster administrator is provided with a config file. And within that config file, the administrator will set threshold values. Specifically in this case, it is total quantity per cart, which is set as 10. So if a request, which is tagged as add to cart and has parameter quantity, which, which basically maps to number of items in the request, um, in, the, in the cart, then if it is greater than 10, it will just be denied, otherwise it will be allowed. So that's the expectation of this uh, demo. So let's start it. So here we are sending a uh, quantity of 10 to Shopizer application. And we see that it will, it will just give a 200 status. It worked successfully. Now, when we set the quantity parameter to be 11 for Shopizer, since our policy is in action, it, the access will be forbidden. To show the well, the generalizability of our framework across the application, we also experimented with juice shop add to cart. And when we set the quantity again as 11, the access was forbidden. Access will be forbidden. So as part of this demo, what we wanted to highlight is that irrespective of the of having different endpoints across applications across juice shop and shopizer and having different uh, different parameters which are controlling the quantity of the items being added to the cart the cluster administrator will just sit, sit peacefully and will just uh, set one parameter and internally this framework will figure out what which parameter in the request corresponds to quantity and just implements the policy so this makes cluster administrator's life very easy So looking ahead, what we wanted to do is we want to open source this whole framework, and we are planning to do it in a few months. Then we, since uh, the, the experiments that we showed you is based on a finite set, a set of intent tags, what we want to do in the future is want to make the intent tag infinite and support and read more applications and uh, understand uh, what are the tags that are relevant across applications and improve accuracy over those tags. Then we also want to explore what are the specialized models that we can use. And some of the models which are specialized in cybersecurity and threat intelligence, we can apply and check how, how that goes. And we are planning to implement lighter models, quantized version of these models, so that at the inference time, the response is much faster and this is more practical and feasible to use in the future. So now Julian will take over some of the interesting insights of our research. Yeah, so I think that's the summary of the talk mainly, but uh, there are some questions that we had along the way which 
Um, I think you might also have. So one of the questions that we explored was, we are, we are saying that we have, we can identify the intent of the request, right? So can we, can we simply say that the intent of this request is to perform in a SQL injection attack? If we are able to do that, uh, you know, that's great. Right? You send a request to LLM, LLM just says, hey, this is a SQL injection attack, stop it. We can just stop it, it's ECSPY, right? So, but we played around with it, but it seems like it's uh, at least the current models, it's not very good at it, so especially when you have requests with a lot of JSON content, some odd characters here and there, some odd parameters, suddenly the uh, LLM keeps saying this is SQL injection while it is not. So that's why we have tried to identify a subset of intents that we feel is common enough, practical enough, that can be identified with good accuracy with the current openly available models. And leverage that as opposed to uh, trying to do everything. So we're trying to strike that balance. Uh, a second concern could be latency. So we are literally saying when the request comes in, make an LLM call to identify the intent of the request, right? So that, that is obviously very expensive. Uh, LLM call, it can take up to a second. And we ran some very initial evaluations if my request kind of without any proxies or anything is coming back in around 400 millisecond, when I do all my LLM calls in the middle, it's quite high, three seconds. It's, it's, uh, it's not really feasible to do in every second, but we can cache this intent tags. If I know that slash API slash add to cart, I made that call once, it came back with this tag saying it's add to cart, and it gave you the parameters in that JSON body, which are important to us, I can just cache this intent and I can cache those parameter keys. So next time I get the same request, I don't have to contact the LLM, right? And caches, it works great in this scenario. And uh, yeah, so, so we can cache the intent tags, we can cache those parameter keys but we cannot cache the parameter value. So in the examples that we saw, we saw count equals to 10. So we can cache that, cache the fact that this request has this keyword count, but I can't cache the value, right? Because the value is, is what the policy is being applied on. So I shouldn't be saying, uh, use the value from the previous request. This is not bad. That is not good, it is bad. So, yeah, and uh, we can, we haven't explored this much, but we can do other things too. We can also look at uh, adding more context. So this is just, so far we only talked about context from this specific request. But imagine you have the context of some past request. So I can also support a scenario where someone is adding items to cart repeatedly over the last five minutes. So if I have some more context, the past data, even that can be used to make better policy decisions. Uh, I think that's all we have uh, as a team. Uh, so all of us work here and more. Yeah. Okay, so be glad to hear any questions you have, any uh, feedback you want to give us? Uh, do you have similar cases where you have, are you trying to use LLMs or something similar? So, yeah, let us know. And uh, that's all we have. Any questions? Let us know. We'll be around here or outside the hall. Uh, please find us. Okay, thank you all. Thanks a lot for coming. Thanks for your time.